So good afternoon everybody and for further proceedings I will hand it over to Dr. Jha. Over to thank, you sir. Thank you Dr. Ashok. Well friends, it's a great privilege being here this afternoon and I welcome our President and Secretary Dr. Shiv Shankar and Dr. Thakkar. Friends, today we have the opening webinar on behalf of IOA and the topic is spondyloarthropathy, which seems to be an unsolvable problem. So the heading is spondyloarthropathy, solution to the unsolved problem and IOA guidelines. Friends, it's a great opportunity to invite our own president, Dr. Siv Shankar, for his presidential address. Good evening, everybody. This is one of the most common problem we all orthopedic surgeons face, the rheumatology patient with spondyloarthropathy. And uh, just before this, we were discussing that early picking up of the disease will prevent a lot of uh, disabilities in the long run. So majority of the time, we pick up at a late stage when it is uh, very clear. So in this direction, Dr. Shivshankar Jha, the senior orthopedic surgeon from Patna has been associated with IOA for the last three years and they have formed already few guidelines for spondyloarthropathy. So with that talk by him at the last, which talks about the IOA guidelines for spondyloarthropathy will be ending. We have a gamut of 10 speakers from Nook and Corner of India. Uh, I can see right now on the screen, Dr. Dilip Majumdar, the president of IORA from Calcutta, Dr. Rajmani from Madurai, Dr. Dhanasekara from Coimbatore, Dr. Naveen Tucker from Ahmedabad, Dr. Kamlesh Tiwari from Bilaspur. So many people are giving this talk and uh, we also have from northeastern corner of India, Dr. Shantanu Laukar, who is the secretary of uh, Indian Dermatology uh, Association. We have the president of the uh, biology, orthobiologics group or the stem cell study group, Dr. Manish Kanna from Lucknow. They all will be sharing their vast knowledge and it will be a great uh, webinar as far as the content is going to be. So welcome all of you for this today's webinar. Well, is that all? Yes, sir. That's yes, fine. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Oh, okay. So now I request our secretary to say a few words of encouragement to this group, Dr. Naveen Thakkar. Yes. On behalf of IOA, we welcome you all for such a very good academic webinar. This is the first webinar. And it has been designed by the, our uh, rheumatology uh, group in the IO committee with the help of the uh, rheumatology association and other renowned faculty. So I wish you start earlier the program for the uh, not missing much time in uh, this uh, initial part. Thank you very much, sir. Please. Right. Thank you very much. Being one of the three conveners, what I have to emphasize that friends these speakers gathered here, they are not ordinary speakers. They had the privilege of being master trainers of IOA in the past years. Well, they will provide an insight into the kingdom of SPA. And this kingdom of SPA has group of diseases with overlapping disorders. Friends, there are roughly 12 symptoms which you see like a dime a dozen but three important things are very important inflammatory back pain peripheral arthritis and enthesitis they are present in each and every case friends i am confident these trainers will create the necessary awareness and also will unfold the tricks for making diagnosis and will help men in the management of spondyloarthropathy. Well, I must say 
that I must congratulate Mr. President Siv Shankar and Secretary Dr. Thakkar for their continuing interest in orthopedic rheumatology. Colleagues, more importantly, this program will provide lawful authority, I repeat, lawful authority for managing patients of spondyloarthropathy. Colleagues, the baton is already in the trainer's hand. And friends, all of us know that unlearn, learn, and relearn is the basic concept of any training program. I now would like to request our chairman, Dr. Tiwari, to say a few opening words. Uh, your your voice, you are mute. Dr. Tiwari, you are mute. Can you yes. uh, good evening, friends. I am Dr. Tiwari Tiwari, chairman of this year rheumatology subcommittee, speaking from July. And uh, I welcome all, all of you. Respected President Sir, Dr. Shivashankar Sir, our Secretary, Dr. Naveen Thakkar sir, and esteemed members of the IORA, Dr. Shri Shankar Jha, Dr. Majumdar, and Dr. Shantun Lakar. They have been kind enough to plan the whole year program and that to in a very splendid May. This year, we have planned series of webinars every alternate month for whole calendar year. Friends, I welcome all the learned speakers of the country for the today's webinar. Our topic, as mentioned by Dr. Shil Shankar, is the Pandalo Arthropathy. I request all the eminent speakers to stick to their designated time and give more and more information to our, our, our friends and colleagues. So now I hand over this mic to our Dr. Jhatar for coordination. Right. Professor Majumdar. It is your honor to be the president of the day of Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. Your address to this gathering. Yes, President Majumdar. You have to unmute, Dr. Majumdar. Philip, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Dilip Majumdar, sir, you have to unmute. So, good evening, everyone here. To the maiden adventure today, as being the president of the Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association, I express my heartfelt veneration to. Dr. Shiv Shankar, our beloved president, for his earnest desire and useful guardian, guidance to grow and gain in the mission and vision of uh, this ever-growing subspecialty for the mankind. The noted struggle, you all, all we know, by the founder father, Professor Jha and Professor Manish Khanna, the secretary general and the uh, at that time, and the then IUA president, Professor R.C. Mina, to earn a nick in the temple of IUA is remarkable. At that time, Dr. Otul Sibasta was the dynamic secretary. So let us pray and hope that this subspecialty, with the help of these golden speakers and the diligent workers, will go a long way in the annals of the history of IOA. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk about. Namaste. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you well, very friends, much. this uh, webinar on spondyloarthropathy makes us conscious that is spondyloarthropathy a group of similar diseases are the only conglomeration of diseases, or there are some variants which will form the differential diagnosis. Friends,
to start with i will like to mention that there are many diseases where we see ankylosis of various ligaments of the spine and they are invariably grouped as spinal ankylosing disorders now it constitutes minimum four conditions one is ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthritis the other is this which we will be talking about subsequently the other is easm this is end stage advanced scoliosis multiformans if you remember fluorosis comes under this heading and the fourth one is opll so when spinal ankylosing disorders ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthropathy is only one now friends i have the pleasure of requesting my first honorable speaker who has been from there from the very beginning of indian orthopedic rheumatology association and it is none else but the president emeritus dr manish khanna so may i invite you for the very first talk uh, talk uh, on introduction to orthopedic rheumatology because we are discussing a part of rheumatology so we thought manish will be the best person to give that introduction he has been head of the department prashad institute and medical sciences and president emeritus dr manish please good evening sir good evening everyone namaskar uh, without wasting time as a opening batsman i'll just uh, go into 7 8 minutes of a brief introduction about what is orthopedic rheumatology what makes it's very important very important to the orthopedic surgeon so i welcome you all on the behalf of iua and iura to this wonderful meet well uh, 50 to 60% of orthopedic cases which we see in our opd they comprises the poly and the mono arthritis low back ache which is the current topic for today these cases may be the cases of rheumatoid or osteo or gouty or psoriatic arthritis whatever it may be but these actually come under the most uh, important issue of getting them cured very well for the beginner orthopedic surgeon who start their practice in order to gain the popularity the confidence of the general population so this is the first thing which is been encountered usually well what is orthopedic rheumatology it is a rapidly evolving medico surgical speciality which is important and useful for orthopedic surgeons especially busy in surgical practice because we are basically surgeons so we are mainly busy in the surgical practice maybe it's fixation maybe it's arthroplasty or whatever it may be so this is a specialty with medical and surgical management with of course the rehabilitation part the most neglected part of orthopedics which is very important as far as the western country counterparts are well if you see the difference between orthopedic surgeon and rheumatology it is a very minor difference there is a lot of overlapping actually both of them treat the problem related to musculoskeletal system but the rheumatologist mainly do it with the medication part an orthopedic surgeon thinks it with the surgery but it always a surgery is been required no so with the early presentation with the early awareness with the early diagnosis definitely all these conditions can be very well tackled and we may prevent them to going to a, a, a severe arthritis that means we are putting axes on our foot for minimizing the arthroplasty but yes it is true for over simplification orthopedic rheumatology catches the medical as well as the surgical part it's not only the medical but medical as well as the surgical part well 12 years back this association was been started and the challenges which make this as a specialist because as i've already mentioned there are limited number of specialists for the remit with the rheumatology training in the urban and semi urban area we all appreciate the strength of orthopedic surgeons in the country and the strength of rheumatologist so definitely it is a limited exposure the lack of infrastructure at many places for the proper management with a multidisciplinary team approach again a big challenge because this is not a specialty which is deal dealing with only with the orthopedic surgeon it is a multidisciplinary team speciality 
general neglect of rheumatology teaching in the undergraduate level but i will say even at the postgraduate level as a postgraduate teacher i myself not able to give sufficient time to this specialty to the pg students because the traumatology part the arthroplasty part the arthroscopy part so many things are there so definitely it is a most untouched area but it caters a lot of space now difficulty in patient education because this branch actually require a more time giving talking uh, uh, habits to the patient so it is a uh, difficult most of the time to give the patient education again all those patient with who are able to diagnose again they are started with the treatment but sometimes there is a loss of follow up there are so many drawbacks are there especially like associated diabetes and hypothyroidism there are so many associated condition which make this a specialty as a complex specialty because a patient of a rheumatoid with a patient of ankylosing or ankylosing patient with a diabetes with a thyroid so definitely the man the management would be a little different for this we have already started for the last 2 year the ortho rheumatology training to the young orthopedic surgeon the aim is always like to give the awareness maximum awareness about the subject and this orthopedic rheumatology is not only dealing with the zero negative or positive arthritis or spondyloarthropathy but all the thing all around this bush maybe from gra from uh, crystal deposition diseases to osteoarthritis to osteoporosis yes osteoporotic fractures you know even osteoporosis is a is a uh, main culprit somewhere with the rheumatology soft tissue condition rheuma miscellaneous rheumatic condition there are so many conditions our aim is definitely to provide guidelines also and this evening we are going to introduce one guideline for the spondyloarthropathy also to reuse favor stimulate in fact all the research work with the upcoming specialty along with the regenerative orthopedics regenerative orthopedic has got a lot of good role in orthopedic rheumatology the maximum role of stem cell is in the orthopedic rheumatology so our aim is to make this as an inter international scientific body having a relation with rest of the world the nation as well as that at international level this is the orthopedic rheumatology fellowship program which we have started with the national university rml law university to rope in it the idea to rope in it was because of the legal insight medical litigations medical jurisprudence medical law they are the things which needed to be taught to the young orthopedic surgeon about its requirement because we are getting into the worse and worse gradually we have got a indexed in house journal which has been indexed at all the places index copernicus is active till 22 and most probably it will be continued this is a journal with a print isn and online number we are entering into pubmed so this is a in house journal for all those all students all the pgs all young persons who are doing the research work to uh, acknowledge it here so friends this is again the same thing this specialty only require is a good exposure good talking good history taking which usually is not there in the surgical skill if it is arthroplasty we have to do arthroplasty if it is fracture we have to do a fixation but here we need a good brain on exercises the idea is to manage the patient not a x ray a good clinician a good orthopedic surgeon is one who first listen examine and then touch the x ray then touch the investigation so it is a little different task actually finally i would like to say that we should try to update ourselves on orthopedic rheumatology with all the recent trends in management with the medical with the surgical with the stem cells and everything and this evening we are going to unfold it for the first time here thank you so much for a very patient hearing thanks a lot so i think dr jha is uh, not here no no i am here okay you are here yeah yeah so th thank you manish for encompassing all the aspects especially i have liked that you have talked about patients involvement in the management program because there are recommendation that patient has to be taken uh, into confidence 
in framing his treatment plan. Number two, that you have advanced the rheumatology concept by starting a fellowship also is so very important. And regenerative medicine is definitely an addo in, in the subject of rheumatology, which will go a long way in treating such patients. So thank you very much, Manish. Now I will request Dr. S. S. Amarnath, who, is, who has been the Director, Geriatric Orthopedic Association of India Bang, from Bangalore. He will speak on ankylosing spondylitis, the diagnosis. Dr. Amarnath, please. Thank you, Dr. Jaya, for uh, giving this opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to share the screen now. And uh, here we are. And I, I, I hope I'm going to be making, uh, or shall I say, uh, uh, some justice, because each of us have been given a very short, sweet six to eight minutes. And with that in mind, and it's not going to be easy, but uh, I'll, I, will, I will definitely take the time and then uh, give that opportunity yeah. to the others to speak as well. Thank you. And this was framed about two years ago, and we had a big number of faculty around the country. And here we are to talk about what, where, how, and uh, uh, to take this entire condition forward. So it's been split into a lot of groups, uh, uh, I mean, in variety of, our, I mean, a group of arthritis. So today we are talking about SPA and uh, other things and other speakers. There will be some side flight which may come into of overlap, but each of us will talk about something differently. Uh, okay, now we are going to be talking about the main things of uh, inflammatory pain, mechanical pain, and all those uh, seven criteria. As we move on, we need to pick it up early. I know uh, I can't read the slides for everyone's benefit. I'm going to just pick up some certain points and then give you some highlights on, on this uh, challenges. Now, inflammatory pain and mechanical pain, uh, in fact, is the commonest thing that each one of us treat and pick up. They come in early sometimes, we may miss the diagnosis. So how do I do that and what do we do? What are the kind of conditions, the inflammatory pain compared to rheumatology, uh, rheumatic arthritis or lumbar spine stenosis or even uh, you know, uh, ordinary non-specific back pains which comes into younger as well as older populations at large. Now, simple things are there, uh, the hematological and radiological. So these are the things which are very, very important. The night pain, and uh, it could be the early morning stiffness. It could be the onset. It could be early onset in teenagers or probably late onset in the 50 and 60 years above. So all these things put together, it makes a massive difference. You know? So I would recommend each one of us to pick it up early. And main point is when somebody comes to the back pain, we just don't have to stick with only back pain. We need to really screen them, screen the pelvis as well. Many a times, uh, spondyloarthropathy can start in the SI joints or even the cervical spine. When they're coming with low back pain, especially, I think I would recommend not just to you know, screen LS spine. The x-rays taken for LS spine is very specific for that. So you please look into screening. Now, what happens when you see, thank you, Dr. Jaya, for this slide, and in fact, we don't want any of us to come in this kind of a problem, right? I mean, he's like a bamboo spine, literally stiff. He can't even bend the you know, thoracic lumbar area. He's bending as one particular unit. So that stiff it's gonna be. So we need to be very, very early in picking up and making sure that they get the right kind of guidance. Now, what happens? We all know that in the radiological challenges, the anterior spinal you know, ligament is gonna get fused. Eventually, the posterior as well get fused. There are early osteophytes. In a regular osteophytes coming in, they come in down, but in ankylosing and spondyloarthropathy, you can see the osteophytes growing on the top. So the fusion starts to happen. So this is the time they've come on very, very late. If you're picking up in radiologically, it is very late for them to come in. So you need to be very careful. This is an X-ray of a pelvis where I'm sure you can appreciate the challenges what's happening here. 
I'll tell you, I know, I'm going to show you in our next slide, which was picked up by an online consultation, which is very, very common nowadays. And then on an average, three to five patients I'm picking up in a week. So I'm sure each one of us can help a lot of patients across the country in getting them better. This patient is hardly 30 year old. And he has been having pain for the last four years, and he's been going pillar to post with orthopedic surgeons with some painkillers. And now he comes there for an online consultation. I said, I need an X-ray. And we get an X-ray. I said, you have this problem. I want you to get some extra investigations. And then there we go. He says, I can't afford it. Then I spoke to the radiologist. And then the radiologist says, get a pelvic oblique view. I will give you the diagnosis. And I don't need to talk to you much about it. The right uh, sacroiliac joint is already getting into the problem. And we have started the treatment. Thankfully, for the last four months, he has been pain-free. For the last three and a half years, he was struggling with pain. Even to turn on his bed was so painful. So this is what is, um, I'm talking about and highlighting. Pick it up early. Please, please, because your patients will be so thankful for you. Now, yes, many of us are talking about MRI. That's the in thing today, the gold standard to pick up the diagnosis. Yes, X-ray can be very, very uh, you know, essential. But by the time you see the X-ray findings, it's so late. Hence, we need to pick up the MRI. MRI is very, very sensitive. It can pick up a simple one, in fact, 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter uh, you know, uh, bone marrow edema. And the arthritis or any other challenges coming in, in the enthesitis problem as well. So that's one thing which is very important, these lesions. Again, you need to understand just because getting an MRI doesn't mean that everything is done because you need an interpreter who is also very well trained to interpret and you also need to have some amount of uh, you know, uh, knowledge of you determining the films, not just reading the report and treating the patient. So I recommend each one of you to see the films as well. So that's very important. So what do we do? In uh, SIJ, uh, what happens? The sacral joints, you pick up very, very early subchondral sclerosis. If you're seeing erosions, that's going to be the big, biggest thing. Don't let MRI pick up the ankylosis because that's going to be very late. And uh, today, thankfully, you can request, you and I can request the laboratory, the diagnostic center to give the discounts and things mm -hmm. like that for the patients to get benefit. And the insurance companies are also there when the patient is admitted to help them out for the diagnostic criteria. And one more thing I want to highlight here, I know this is a little different, but government of India has given 5,000 rupees reprieve for the tax benefit. They can use it for the preventive investigations per annum. It's been there for the last eight years, and I would recommend uh, people, uh, patients to use that. Now, I know we have gone through all this. I don't want to confuse and take it forward. And diagnosis and diagnostic criteria. When we talk about the slides have been picked up, I mean, divided into two, three parts. Now, you have a patient who's got pain in the back for the last three plus months. We've been treating with anti-inflammatory painkillers. Many a time, patient goes to the pharmacy. He doesn't want to consult, spend extra money. So he goes and taking self-medication, the problem starts. Because he or she has already got one or two of autoimmune conditions like diabetes or endocrine problems like thyroid and diabetes. You know, you name it, you know, it's, it goes on and on. And spinal orthopathy comes into another picture, another mode as well. So there may be so many, kind, you know, uh, problems there. So if you were to have one or two or many of these, you know, uh, problems that you can pick up, symptoms that you can share, and, you know, the kind of uh, signs that you have to label, you need to definitely x-ray. Many a times they would have not been x-rayed either. So very, very important. If you're taking the next point is spondyloarthritis coming into picture for your x-ray and then take it for the blood investigation if they, are, if they are positive or negative. So it could be either way. So these criteria are very, very important. And I would encourage each one of you to take it forward. And then I'm finishing the slide very soon in the next uh, second or two. So these are the very two criteria for your benefit. We need to understand. And uh, the ASAS criteria are the biggest thing. Just because HLA-B27 is positive in the blood, many a times it can be MRI negative. It could be sometimes MRI negative and blood negative as well. So you can pick up an MRI very, very soon, very early. And we don't want this ankylosing or even uh, you know challenges to go through that. So these are the very, very simple uh, 
you know, uh, pictures and uh, uh, slides to pick up and uh, make sure that you pick it up early so that you can treat early. I will not take that much time. So we don't want your patients, our patients to go to this fine kind of ankylosing and getting into bamboo, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. spine. So it's going to be very tough for them. So what is the difference between the dish and AS? There are a lot of things. It comes, uh, you know, above 50 and closing much, much below, much, much earlier, you know, third or fourth, fourth trimester, you know, in, the, in their uh, decades of the age. And a uh, lot of deformities are there. Hence, we need to make sure that we need to pick it up early and make sure the patient is treated early and then take it forward. Now, last slide, basically osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, gout and AS, very, very important. So pick up these kind of things and then take it forward because other, other speakers are going to come in and share a lot of points which overlap. I appreciate the time given to me and I thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Dr. Amarnath. So the difference has been outlined that while classifying and understanding spondyloarthropathy, changing from an ordinary radiograph to a routine MRI of the sacroiliac has changed the whole scenario. Now we know radiographic spondyloarthropathy and non-radiographic. And all of us must be aware that some of the non-radiographic spondyloarthropathy, they continue to remain at least in 15 to 20% of the cases. We will be coming to discussion later so now I request Professor Ravi Sauta, Director and Head, Level 1 Trauma Resource Center, Department of Joint Replacement and Orthopedics at Artemis Gurgaon NCR. Dr. Sauta is going to speak on psoriatic arthritis, the diagnosis. Dr. Sauta, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaha, uh, for kind words of appreciation. Uh, my job is made a little simpler by previous speakers. Uh, diagnosis and diagnostic criteria for psoriatic arthritis and peripheral uh, arthritis I'm going to be talking about. And uh, in this, basically, uh, the learning objective would be to see the symptoms, diagnostic approach for the peripheral arthritis, ASA criteria for the peripheral arthritis, diagnosis of a psoriatic arthritis versus rheumatoid and Casper cri uh, criteria for diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis and the different differential diagnostic features. So uh, spondyloarthritis basically is a conglomerate of uh, disorders which uh, where there is an axial uh, involvement and where there is an undifferentiated uh, spondyloarthropathy. Under this comes the psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis and uh, inflammatory bowel diseases and so on and so forth. Basically, uh, the, the problem is complex because psoriatic arthritis involves uh, skin, joint, as, as, well, as well as few people have a lot of comorbidities. And these are the number of specialists which are usually involved in treating these patients. As already pointed out by Dr. Amarnath that, and Dr. Manish uh, in previous talks that because of the scarcity of the specialists of rheumatologists, Across the country, it is orthopedic surgeon who may be the first point of a contact and that is the reason why uh, training for the orthopedic surgeons is important. And onset of psoriatic arthritis basically appears, uh, it, uh, psoriasis uh, either precedes almost in eight, 60 to 80 percent of the patients uh, it precedes and generally uh, it may be, it may take even 20 years before, uh, osteo, uh, before the psoriatic arthritis appears. And in about 15 to 20 percent of the patient, arthritis uh, appears before the psoriasis. It is very rarely when the arthritis and psoriasis they appear simultaneously. Only presentation at times may be joint stiffness. There may be a pain and discomfort. Most of the times, the symptoms are insidious in onset. Acute onset of symptoms are reported in almost uh, uh, one third of these patients. And these are the typical uh, different types of arth anthocytis and dactylitis. These are uh, different sites which are involved. Generally, diagnosis of uh, peripheral arthritis when you look at the ultrasound and what they call a MSK ultrasound and MRI scan, these pick up the early anthocytis as emphasized by uh, previous speakers that picking up these patients early uh, is very important. And similarly, in peripheral arthritis, if the MRI is done 
or ultrasound is done, tenosynovitis or bursitis can be picked up. AS, AS criteria are uh, basically uh, which uh, are helpful in uh, differentiating the uh, differentiating the various uh, uh, peripheral arthritis. And when you look at the patient of uh, arthritis, enthesitis, and dactylitis, the, these, those who present, if they have one of these symptoms, which have uh, uh, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, or there is a preceding infection, or HLA-B27 is positive, uveitis, or sacroiliac involvement. Uh, or there are more than two of these criteria that like arthritis, enthesitis, or dactylitis. So sensitivity for uh, this uh, criteria is almost 80% and specificity is almost 80%. As far as the uh, psoriatic arthritis is concerned, to differentiate it from the rheumatoid arthritis, you look at the joints which are involved. You see enthesitis, which is more common and more typical uh, in psoriatic arthritis. Dactylitis is again seen in uh, psoriatic arthritis. Axial involvement and the peripheral joint involvement, which is uh, more common in psoriatic arthritis as compared to the rheumatoid. Nail and skin involvement is classically seen in the uh, psoriatic arthritis, especially pitting of the nails and the nail changes. Uh, as far as the serology is concerned, usually in these patients, rheumatoid uh, factor is negative and uh, anti-CCP is usually negative. So these are very, uh, you know, uh, there may be a typical classical changes in the radiology, which could be helpful. When you look at the epidemiology uh, screening, uh, it is recommended annually for the patients uh, who do not have a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Nice guidelines they talk about when you ask patients the, if they have a swollen joint, if they have a, uh, arthritis uh, or their doctor have told them they are suffering from the arthritis and look at their uh, fingernails, if there is a pitting or holes into the nails and if there is a heel pain and uh, if there is a uh, there is a soreness or a swelling into the fingers so uh, each one of these criteria uh, get one point and one score and uh, uh, if there is a total scoring more than 3 or more then uh, it is a time for a general practitioner to refer these patients to either orthopedic surgeon or to the rheumatologist uh, about 40% of the patients of psoriasis uh, uh, develop psoriatic arthritis uh, and about in about 5 to 10 years. Generally, if you look at the enthesitis, which is seen in almost 60 to 80% of the patient, tendo-achilles uh, pain and uh, also lateral epicondylitis, dactylitis is very common. Again, uh, increased ESR, CRP is seen, but the low RA and NTCCP is uh, very classical of this. These are the classical uh, clinical pictures of them. Uh, one can see that there is a DIP and a PIP involvement in these uh, particular uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis. And uh, classically, one can see there is a deformity in the distal uh, phalangeal joints, which is, uh, which is uh, more likely in the psoriatic arthritis. As far as the various uh, criteria are concerned, basically, these are uh, mole and right and European uh, spondyloarthropathic uh, study group, uh, but most important is to uh, look at these CASPER uh, uh, criteria, which uh, highlight this uh, are highly sensitive. And in this uh, evidence of psoriasis, you look for the nail dystrophy, you look for the negative rheumatoid factor, dactylitis, and the radiographic changes. Uh, it is seen that about uh, three or more uh, these points have about 99% specificity and 92% of a sensitivity for diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. So uh, when you talk of a classification criteria for psoriatic arthritis, which means it is uh, basically looking at the CASPER criteria in this current psoriasis or a personal family history of psoriasis is important to note and each one get one point and psoriatic uh, nail dystrophy or a current examination talks gives one point uh, negative rheumatoid arthritis factor gives one point dactylitis in a uh, current or a history in the past gives one point and a radiological evidence of a juxta articular or a bony involvement again as i told you that the sensitivity and specificity is more than 90 and 98 percent so, so uh, you need to differentiate uh, these uh, psoriatic arthritis from osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, gouty arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. In this, when you look at psoriasis, 
uh that means the skin changes uh, uh there are nail atrophic changes enthesitis dactylitis peripheral joint involvement and simultaneous axial joint involvement which is uh, again a more classical in psoriatic arthritis stiffness and a pain is more common in almost all these disorders a uh, rheumatoid factor if it is negative that is very very uh, helpful in in pinpointing where what we are dealing with so in conclusion uh, there is no specific diagnostic test which can be used for uh, fixing up a psoriatic arthritis however most characteristic laboratory uh, laboratory abnormalities uh, in the patients with the condition are as follows so it is to repeat the same things which i have already discussed that esr crp is usually elevated in about uh, 90 to 90% 95% of the patients have a rheumatoid factor which is negative mm -hmm. about uh, 10 to 20% of the patient may have the uric acid which is slightly raised when you look at the low levels of uh, circulating immune complexes in about 50% of patients serum immunoglobulin levels a are increased in about 2/3 uh, of these patients and when you look at the synovial fluid there is uh, usually a very high number of the cells Uh, which could be from 5000 to 15000 in per high power field in 50% of these patients complement levels are either in a reference range uh, or they are slightly increased so uh, these are a few uh, guidelines which would help us in diagnosing the uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, and uh, making the diagnosis relatively early is very important and uh, that's uh, the emphasis thank you very much uh, for patient hearing thank you professor said sauta for being almost in time now jogesh kamath who is a hip knee and sports surgeon from mangalore will again speak on psoriatic arthritis pathogenesis and related events he will also like to clarify some of the earlier stated objectives in psoriatic arthritis doctors jogis thank you very much uh, uh, dr ja for that lovely introduction and uh, professor sota has made my life very simple uh, by giving a wonderful introduction to psoriatic arthritis so uh, greetings to everybody again from mangalore and um, i'll go ahead uh, with stress on pathogenesis and prevalence i am a hip and knee surgeon but even though i don't practice uh general orthopedics i practice only specialty understanding of this is of utmost importance as uh, clearly explained by uh, dr chaw before so all of us must chiefly understand what we are talking about when it comes to psoriasis essentially understanding what peripheral spondyloarthritis is spondyloarthritis as we all know relates to the axial skeleton that is the spine which is going to be present in a subclinical phase in almost all of these patients but what is it that makes this peripheral chronic inflammatory arthropathy different the key features here to remember clearly are and should be sorry for some reason it's stuck i'll just go ahead yes so here the uh, problems are predominantly peripheral that is in most of these patients you will get problems in the toes and the fingers and there is bound to be some enthesitis of course in psoriatic arthritis the lower limbs are more commonly involved but you can randomly get affections of different joints under this peripheral spondyloarthritis heading one of course the main thing is psoriatic arthritis in terms of incidence but under the same roof we consider reactive arthritis and spondyloarthritis related to inflammatory bowel diseases now the other two are less common psoriasis related arthritis is the most common which is why we are talking specifically in relation to psa or psoriatic arthropathy when it comes to reactive arthritis it is often a diagnosis of exclusion 
because it follows some infection sometimes and can be confused with septic arthritis. So here one has to be careful and one has to make a, a diagnosis after ruling out infections. Reactive arthritis stays generally related to one or two joints, whereas the other inflammatory arthritis and psoriasis will affect more joints altogether. Now, I would reiterate here that, you know, keep asking the patient, as uh, Ravi just said before, about enthesitis, particularly there could be very, very subtle features of heel pain or tennis elbow, which had not looked, uh, been looked into in detail earlier. Dactylitis, of course, is more easy to correlate, but enthesitis is a much commoner feature. It is there in almost all of them, if not three quarters. Dactylitis is relatively less common. So heel pain, elbow pain, general fatigue, and what is often interpreted as tight calves, etc., is and should be the important, uh, you can say, the uh, uh, red flag sign in these cases. Now, it is important to understand how these things just come up. It may not come up suddenly. It may come up over a period of months to years. And... Uh, it could be various environmental exposures which triggers things off and starts with psoriasis. It could be genetic predominance like you have with HLA-B27. And all of these people will have a negative uh, zero, uh, uh, zero positivity. That is a negative rheumatoid factor. Environmental exposures are increasingly be being given importance, but these can be very difficult to uh, it can be very difficult to say what actually started off the immune process. So the preclinical phase, as is described here, is when uh, you know the immune system actually gets activated. It is not going to be possible to detect this even if we do regular screening, because this is the phase where we know anyway, uh, the commonest done factor, the seropositive rheumatoid is anyways going to be negative, and you're going to get uh, in increased probably in the later phases only we will get an increased C-reactive protein. But the preclinical, when it goes to the subclinical phase, we might start getting some positive markers in ultrasound and MRI, as my previous speaker very, very elaboratively stated. And then comes the prodromal or the actual psoriatic arthritis. It is very important to understand this because a lot of these get mixed uh, missed in the initial phase. Now we have very good treatments available. We'll come to that later. But again, lies the importance of actually picking them up in these middle phases when it's possible. So the CASPER or the classification criteria have been well stated by my previous speaker. The most uh, uh, important factor here is if there is psoriasis, which of course makes the diagnosis easy, but we will see later that people can develop arthritic changes even before they develop skin diseases in some of them. So if there's a family history, one should again have suspicion. Then there are all those environmental factors like we talked about before. The other important points which have high sensitivity as per these cri uh, 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 criteria here are clearly nail dystrophy, uh, dactylitis if you get it, and of course, if there is early radiographic affection. Rheumatoid factor, of course, will be negative. Now, the transition factors and what would put somebody at higher risk, this is something orthopedic surgeons must be aware of. I'm not putting in busy slides uh, and wasting time talking about the relative risk because that would be too much information, but Three things to remember here is if the psoriasis is on the scalp, anywhere above the neck, behind the ears, or people don't realize, they many times go to dermatologists thinking they have a bad dandruff, which actually turns out to be a psoriasis in the scalp, under the hair. Lesions can very well be covered by hair. And this is something without other skin lesions, which could predispose you to psoriatic arthritis. Of course, a lesion of inverse psoriasis, like you can see here with the pit and nail psoriasis, must be really looked at with a lot of caution for development of arthritic changes. And of course, you've got all the other factors here, first degree relatives, obesity, and patients with severe psoriasis. Now, 
we know that all psoriatic arthritis or a lot of psoriatic arthritis can go into uh, i'm sorry psoriasis can go into psoriatic arthritis but like i said before one fifth of cases will have presence of arthritis before you detect um, uh, skin lesions and we must understand that a good half of patients with psoriasis will eventually half or more will develop arthritis within 5 to 10 years so therefore again importance and i'm repeating these clinical features look at enthesitis keep asking for dactylitis of course lab parameters you will not get anti ccp and rheumatoid factor in these patients so here is again uh, a very very high index of clinical suspicion and keep repeating crp esr because that is the basic simplest thing one can do when monitoring psoriasis patients now lastly uh, why why is it important i will end with that i won't take too much longer patients once they develop arthritis will have a bad quality of life and mind you 50% of psoriatic arthritis goes unrecognized across the world the figure would be much higher in our country so um, i i really appreciate dr ja and everybody else taking all these active initiatives and being backed by ioa lastly i will just state some definitions of how psoriasis transmits into psoriatic arthritis so of course any psoriasis is at risk and preclinical is not diagnosable because you have just the immune system being activated what we must actually be aware of and the reason for this lecture is only to see if you can actually pick up subclinical and prodromal that is before you get obvious clinical features suspect with the right investigations in the right time so if you pick this up and we succeed in actually training our colleagues to pick up subclinical and prodromal we've done our job today of course a lot of it is treatment naive and the term treatment naive is used when it is diagnosed but it has not got treatment that is within 6 months now early psoriatic arthritis is also defined because this is within 1 year of getting joint related symptoms and findings and if you pick it up again in that point treatment will lead to reversal of changes of course my colleagues who are coming later will elaborate on treatment i will stop my talk here thank you very much again for a patient listening thank you thank you dr jogis the last two lectures have covered about peripheral spondyloarthropathy the first lecture second lecture rather had covered the axial spondyloarthropathy so we are aware by now that spondyloarthropathy is axial and peripheral the axial one has a non radiographic and a radiographic class finally one word of location of this skin lesions is peri anal location of the lesion must also be viewed and that may be the only locations so behind the ears and around the umbilicus and uh, around the uh, peri anal region these three sites must be looked for dr jogesh you made things very clear thank you thank you sir now is the last presentation in session a after that we will be having discussions so if there are no questions from the audience i would like to initiate discussion amongst ourselves only so next speaker is professor ravi gupta who is head of the department and medical superintendent government medical college chandigarh he speaks on spondylo arthropathy current concepts so friends now when the mind is tuned to hear everything once again we are going to talk about what spondylo arthritis is dr ravi gupta yeah a very good afternoon to all in fact with such a learned faculty all the concepts which we have talked till now they appear to be current 
but you know i'll talk about some of the things which may be some repetition or they may be new things so if we try to understand that why the new terminology of spondyloarthritis or spondyloarthropathies has come because in older times we used to talk whether it is a zero positive arthritis or it is a zero negative arthritis so all zero negative arthritis now are being classified as spondyloarthritis so they have two classes as already told one is peripheral spondyloarthritis which is mainly a psoriatic arthritis while the second one is axial spondyloarthritis which is mainly ankylosing spondylitis so as i mentioned the zero negative connotes where the ra factor is negative so there are typically extra articular manifestations in this group of disorders which may include acute anterior uveitis which is related to ophthalmologist because we talk that it is a team which treats these disorders then there may be skin lesions like psoriasis dr jha mentioned about the various areas then with inflammatory bowel disease it may appear like crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and then commonly they are associated from musculoskeletal point of view the patients may have anthesitis or dactylitis so the main feature is uh, the patient has morning stiffness and pain and these disorders they have kind of chronic inflammatory diseases of autoimmune nature sharing certain clinical features and common genetic associations usually they have hla b27 positive so now here when i say autoimmune or anti inflammatory or inflammatory disorders still you know there is lot of debate in this because it's not really clear whether they are inflammatory or they are truly autoimmune because i actually there are no auto antibodies which have could be seen in these disorders in all the cases similarly typically the the typical features of inflammation have not been seen so people think that they are a kind of overlapping disorder so these are the uh, features as mentioned by many of us that there is stiffness there may be stiffness of whole of the spine may be cervical spine or dorsal lumbar spine so this is an important slide where you know this is in the adults when we see this disease there can be three kinds of uh, presentations of the patient depending upon the chronicity of the disease if the disease is less than 5 years old usually the x ray shows no disease while if you look for the mri of the sacroiliac joint we may find some inflammation but if the disease progresses beyond 5 years and up to 10 years then this disease has peripheral arthritis and anthesitis like in the early onset also but one may be able to see sacroiliitis by the x rays we have seen the x rays of various formal speakers where the sacroiliitis could be seen then if the disease is further chronic more than 10 years old then you may see the visibility of syndesmophytes that is new bone formation in the x ray which we call it as a bamboo spine now spondyloarthritis is a very very common condition in india it is second only to rheumatoid arthritis and the prevalence of spondyloarthritis is 1 in 1000 which is not rare out of 1000 people one or two persons may be suffering from this disease and if you look at all the low back ache patients in your clinics one to two percent of those low back ache patients are likely to be suffering from spondyloarthritis and as we know the males they typically outnumber the females and there are different studies which have shown 
the the difference in male female ratio may be 5 is to 1 to even 18.7 is to 1 now these are the typical features when we look at the functional you know uh, effect of this disease on the population the absenteeism the people tend to be absent from their works and even if they are present their work per productivity is reduced by either 50% or even lesser than 50% due to this disease. And for more number of days, the people require help from someone for even, you know, especially in chronic diseases, for even their activities of daily living. So this leads to, you know, even social inactivity in these, in these patients. So this is one of the papers which showed that uh, this is the uh, around zero to 30 days of absenteeism was seen in approximately 56% of the patients and from one month to two months in the further 35 and uh, two months to up to six months in the 19%. So this is the actually so much effect of this disease in the population. And then, you know, what kind of works they are affected with. These people are usually unable to do heavy lifting. And if they are working with the trunk, they work with awkward position because the flexibility of the trunk is affected. And when they are sitting or standing for prolonged periods, they get the problems. And the drivers, when they are driving for especially more than six hours a day, they can get symptoms or uh, discomfort. So uh, work-related distress, when you see in a scale from 0 to 100, you know, uh, it was approximately 32 uh, as a mean and 40 as a median. And uh, many pa patients, they had a fear of returning to work. That is uh, almost 50% of the uh, population, when they suffer from disease, when they go absent, they have a fear for returning to the work. And again, the job satisfaction is also around 50%. So uh, uh, that's all about you know, the current concepts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ravi. So now we come to the end of this session. And now we will have discussion amongst ourselves. Please stop sharing the slide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, if there are any questions, Dr. Shyam, uh, I don't think there are many questions in the chat box. Dr. Shyam, can you help us? Okay. So in the meantime, we will open the discussion. Well, Dr. Amarnath, Dr. Amarnath is here? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I'm, yes. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, yes. So you have discussed at length the various radiographic changes and preferably in the MRI. So one investigation that has to be asked for, or maybe I should say two investigations, what two investigations you will definitely suggest? Sir, to a I patient. Can't... Yes, I, I just said that Routinely, we do not ask for an MRI, but in your descriptions, you have talked about the various findings in an MRI. So would you be very comfortable while requisitioning an MRI and also HLA B27? Thank you. Sir, yes, definitely. Now, most of the patients, I would definitely advise everyone to uh, screen them both serologically and radiologically, one. Now, the biggest challenge what I have seen uh, in the practice now is the affordability of the MRI because the MRI itself is so expensive of seven to 8,000 varying from different centers to throughout the country and picking up uh, for them is going to be challenging. Now with Corona times, it's going to be even more challenging because the expenditures are going up, the income has come down. So these are the little challenges which I've seen in the last one year plus. So keeping that in mind, 
keeping the patient's comfort and the finances in mind i would definitely recommend the serological test which is very important now that will give us a guidance whether he or she is positive if human leukocyte antigen is positive or negative we can still treat them accordingly as an early stage now in the x ray definitely the changes are going to be much 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 later so but still we can pick up certain early big uh, changes which is happening in the si joints more than in the spine so i would recommend each of them uh, every one to include the pelvis specifically looking for si joint because when you taking a ls spine x ray the the ray is a focus for the ls spine and it is not uh, you know concentrating for si joint that is the reason and if there is any suspicion in fact uh, the radiologist a few of them uh, whom i have interacted with across the country have said please recommend an oblique view of an si joint of the pelvis concentrating on the pelvis and then that will be very very uh, clinching diagnosis so i would recommend sir definitely radiologically x ray if and an oblique view if required if they are not able to afford we can look at the serological and counsel them and make the point very clear before giving them any kind of treatment uh the colleagues are going to be coming and talking about the treatment so naturally picking it up early is very important i would recommend uh, both as you rightly said the serological in that specifically after getting the investigations i would also include anti nuclear antibodies so that is ana so either we could do an ana and then if there are any positivity coming in then we can look at the profile rather than getting the entire profile done for 4 to 5000 rupees it could be expensive so a simple uh, flow cytometry uh, anti nuclear antibody would also again give us if its rheumatology uh, factor uh, rheumatoid factor is negative or even anti ccp uh, you know uh, anti citrullinated uh, 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 report is negative that classifies under zero negative hence i would recommend very very clearly hope i made the point right. clear yes uh, right you have taken into consideration the financial burden dr ravi gupta if there are radiological findings in the sacroiliac joint ordinary x ray dr ravi gupta dr ravi are you here yes sir yes sir okay so if a patient has shown in the x ray of the sacroiliac joint the changes what is likely to be the time elapsed from the beginning of the disease uh, usually it is more than 5 years sir yes so you have been very correct that that one particular slide was so important that 0 to 5 years if you have to detect you might arrange funds from somewhere some social organization but we must ask for mri of the sacroiliac joint and if it is a infant or a child so juvenile spondyloarthropathy we have to uh, requisition mri of the sacroiliac joint because never before 5 years we are to get any findings in ordinary x ray dr manish you agree no sir i don't agree to this point uh, the okay. reason behind is the reason behind is uh, so i'll again want to say few things actually the number one is sure, uh, sure. mri is definitely a very good finding but we are sitting on the other side of the river if you ask a radiologist to report uh, enthesitis or earlier changes they are not able to give actually uh, to that clue so my consideration is the clinical correlation is the foremost important thing number 1 number 2 sir i have seen the young children young boys within 2 to 3 years showing x ray findings x ray changes specifically in those cases the mri also shows the uh, uh, findings for the sclerosis and we were able to pick up the ankylosing spondylosis cause hlb27 is many time normal and normal finding in uh, normal population also so we can't go it for in that way so i feel sir x ray uh, i don't agree to this thing though literature definitely says uh, dr ravi has very well picked up that slide 
but clinically we find lot of radiological changes in the spine in the uh, in sorry in the si joint within 5 years of the time yes dr manish your is yes add please point here, sir. Your yeah. yes please yogi yeah. yes can i you know just uh, i think dr khanna has very rightly pointed out because when we say 0 to 5 years or 5 to 10 years we talk about the larger population that doesn't mean that there may not be outliers the outliers are always there so what is written in the literature and what we see in our day to day life that this disease when it starts it is so much mildly symptomatic first it will start with intermittent discomfort right and then the patient sensitivity is also different some patient will come to your clinic even with intermittent discomfort the other patient will not come to you even with pain so these are the modalities to pick up right in the early stage why why we want to pick up because it is not only a kind of physical disease it's a lifestyle disease also the current concepts very clearly show that it is the microbiome of the gut actually which is the main culprit so there is some kind of dysbiosis which they call that is the altered microbiomes which sends the wrong signals to the you know the tissues of the joints at the molecular level which is the cause of the disease so this goes on goes on and then this the you know the uh, the dysbiosis the causes exact people don't know but you know the eating habits and you know the less of the uh, the fibers in the diet more of the empirical antibiotics all those things are important so uh, if you get up early then it may be of helpful right dr gupta you have brought out a very valid point that everything is centered towards early diagnosis and over and above that this is a teaching module where the ideal things will have to be talked individually you can always use your clinical See, judgment so i have a and, point that yes. in in our country setup in our tropical world in our india we have a little different clinical picture and what the literature we are just picking up most of the time discussing is a literature from uh, western part so we have a little different uh, presentation I, I, and I, 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 i yeah. understand your view point dr manish that india has a different kind of a disease topography uh, where studies will be needed to really understand but don't you think we are we are missing out on many cases who have reported in the opd just for back pain dr jogis you wanted to yes, say yes yes so definitely uh, we potentially uh, i have i have the fortune of a rheumatologist sitting next door so uh, we definitely believe that uh, spondyloarthritis the proportion of spondyloarthritis is probably higher than higher in india than uh, elsewhere among the various types and we just know that it is second to rheumatoid arthritis but it is probably uh, we are getting it in a lot of youngsters and the problem again is we see many of these in the late stages so uh uh that's very true sir the other thing i wanted to say in favor of uh, dr manish's argument was even though we might advocate mris the proportion of uh, radiologists reporting mris with good musculoskeletal experience is also limited so what many times happens is i have seen radiologists just looking for sacroiliitis if there is no sacroiliitis they would probably rule out ankylosing spondylitis and there are other features of early calcification of ligaments and you know what we see on the disc scan the syndesmophytes etc which could uh, you know not be very obvious even to the trained eye so the to to the relatively untrained eye is what i mean so therefore clinical suspicion and education awareness is probably of the utmost importance because what happens particularly again in a slightly financially compromised situation is a patient has an mri or bolta hai ki mri ho gaya abhi 2 saal ke liye kuch nahi karna which is when they have a false right. sense of security and the disease might attack 
so it is actually educating them rightly and be aware of doing it when we have the first sign of problems probably what is your thought on that uh, dr jogesh what i feel is yeah. when you are talking about education education or training training of the radiologist yeah. in your own town you have to locate one or two centers where the mri persons they are knowledgeable enough and yes. i would say don't ask for a mri lumbosacral spine tell mm -hmm. them specifically mri of the sacroiliac mm -hmm. there have been number of times that i have returned the mri done and i say no specific to rule out any sacroiliac pathology and now i am getting consistent reports well mm -hmm. friends it has been a very healthy discussion we are here to differ and even as orthopedic surgeon we have always differed on the way we like to treat conservative or operative we will have last comment from professor chinmay das professor chinmay sir, any so comment chinmay and yes, dana sekar both have raised their hand yeah sir uh, thank you thank you for the opportunity sir sir i would just like to add uh, uh, dr amarnath was uh, referring to oblique view of the uh, pelvis sir uh, to be more specific is it 15 degree caudal view of the pelvis uh, dr i just Amarna, want to add please, please 15 degree oblique view means 15 degree caudal view of the pelvis that is more helpful i think uh, for uh, this uh, sacroiliac joints to visualize yes, this yes yes i i think you you're right uh, yeah, many thanks. of the uh, many of the times when we ask for oblique the technicians are not trained to do the x ray i mean x rays i mean the, that's another big challenge so we need to speak to the radiologists because that most of the diagnosis is made by the history and clinical uh, examination that is the biggest thing and then you are only substantiating it one because to show to the patient and two the medical legal issues which is uh, very big and very high which is going in a big alarming stage so we also need to make sure that uh, we need to get that kind of a you know view and you're absolutely correct there oblique view it is not a sudes view but again it definitely i mean judes view but in the, on yeah. a similar line what you're talking about but yeah, this is specifically for si joint not pelvis yeah, judes view is uh, around 45 degrees Yes, uh, so, so it will be less than that. Fifteen, fifteen degrees. Yes, of, uh, it is. Yeah, model. and again, you will be focusing the ray for the SI joint rather than the whole pelvis. Yes, so that's yeah. where the difference comes from the Judas to here. Yeah. As yes. far and as thanks, sacroiliac thanks. joints are concerned, one view which also is of paramount importance is posterior anterior view, and you have rightly said fifteen degree caudal views so that the sacroiliac joints could be seen. now only last week i was hearing some rheumatologist speak we are used to fifth, uh, left oblique or right oblique views they say oblique these oblique views which are 45 degree left or right are not advisable they do not give you accurate assessment of the sacroiliac joint any any other person would sir, like to intervene sir one one small uh, comment i just want to pass please, since please. we are on online and lot of younger generation are into it and we had a very healthy discussion i would like to take this home message to everybody especially the younger generation if we have reached to a diagnosis when the anthro uh, uh, this anthocytosis has been there damage has been there the train has already left the station no matter what the biological therapy you are going to have the idea should be to have a early diagnosis it is really a clinical judgment there is no thumb rule as such it will be a request to every younger orthopedic surgeon everybody to make it as early as possible because still 70 to 80% diagnosis we can't make it so don't uh be in uh, that a scenario that you can't write a undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy you can write a undifferentiated on spondyloarthropathy on your letter head and can you can start the earlier treatment as is early as possible because so many things still make it very much uncomfortable and the patient when finally come to us is in a state of uh, arthroplasty and all those things where the train has already left the station there's no use so we have to be a little different from others in that way well dr manish i have taken your points very positive thoughts very uh, trend changing points but i must make it there are very many missed cases 
the cases in which the enthesitis has appeared, dactylitis has appeared, the spine has become stiff beyond doubt. So I, it has never been said, and it will be in future lectures, will be clarified that history is very important. And I always keep on telling to my students, talk, talk, and talk to the patient till the patient gives you the diagnosis, meaning thereby diagnosis lies not in investigation, but your history taking. Definitely, definitely. That, that becomes very important, number one. Number two, Dr. Manis, I would like to say, magic of 10 words is one, one uh, phrase coined in rheumatology. It says, when a patient comes to you, you write in 10 words what you feel like the patient. Suppose he says, 40 years elderly male, complaining of morning stiffness in the back, something like this. So there is a definite direction given to your provisional diagnosis. So your first path is that you make out those 10 words. So that is what is known as magic of 10 words. Friends, this brings us to the end of the first session. And now we will start the second session and continue our discussions there. Well, second session, Dr. P. Dhanasekhra Raja. He is a senior joint replacement surgeon from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, and he speaks on spondyloarthropathy and ankylosing spondylitis, the pathogenesis. This is going to be a very cream paper, which again focuses on what are the real behind the scene changes going on for producing this spondyloarthropathy. Dr. Raja, please. Thank you, Professor Jha. Uh, we'll come to the topic, important topic of pathogenesis of spondyloarthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. So we know axial spondyloarthritis, we have been discussing, is a disease affecting the axial skeleton, mainly spine and sacroiliac joint. And ankylosing spondylitis is one of the important type of axial spondylitis, spondylitis, which progresses to radiological sacroiliitis over a period of time that we have been discussing about this, how to diagnose it early before it causes uh, uh, ankylosis. So there is a non-radiographic stage and you have inflammatory back pain with normal radiograph or positive uh, early MRI signs. And when it starts forming uh, osteophytes, uh, osteophyte formation and ankylosis, it becomes typical ankylosing spondylitis. So there is progressive syndesmode formation, fusion, and the entire spine is, uh, becomes a bamboo spine and the costochondral joints are fused and patient uh, undergoes a lot of uh, disability and presence. So surgery is a good option, but uh, throughout their uh, course of life, because of misdiagnosis, they are uh, suffering. So we need to understand the pathogenesis, what initiates and drives spontaneous chronic inflammation, why the enthesis and axial skeletons are targeted, what is the role of gastrointestinal inflammation and the mechanism of apparent bone formation and bone loss. So pathogenesis, there are two major uh, triggers. One is the genetic risk factor itself. Second, the environmental trigger, which is mainly the infectious agents. So coming to the uh, uh, pathogenesis of ankylosis molitis, genetics, genetics forms a major role in development of the uh, disease. And there is a very strong family aggregation. You have a, a first degree relative who has this problem. There's a 10% chance that uh, one of the family members is, is going to get it. And if there is a, they are identical twins, the concordance rate is almost like 63%. If non-identical twins, it is 23%. The major histocompatibility gene, HLA-B27, is one of the uh, triggering factor. And it explains only 20% of the genetic inheritance. There are other MHC genes and non-MHC genes, uh, namely ERAP1 and interleukin-23 uh, gene, which contribute about 8% of the genetic inheritance. More than 72% of the inheritance is still not been explained. But the, the concluding evidence is genetic predisposition is present. Second, what happens in ankylosing spondylitis? there is alteration of the conformation of the HLA heavy chain. So we know what is CD8 cell. It is an antigen-presenting cell, which is self-sensitized by the orthotogenic peptides. 
So the orthodogenic peptides sensitize the CD4 and it causes the antigen presenting cells to uh, release interleukin. Second uh, pathology they explained is HLA B27 induced unfolding of the uh, collagen uh, peptide in the endoplasmic retinaculum where there is synthesis of proteins and collagen peptides or chains are formed. There is unfolding of the uh, collagen chains. These two factors cause the release of interleukin 23 from these cells. So this is the uh, overall uh, pathogenesis and the most important slide of this presentation, which uh, one should understand the role of interleukin-3 and interleukin-17. These two mediators are the prime uh, mediators for the, all these effects of ankylosing small lattice. And we need to be aware of this uh, 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 chain of reactions which causes this problem. And by, by, the, by this, we can address the uh, problem early. So we discuss how the antigen presenting cells release interleukin-23 and which causes the helper cells to release interleukin 17A. This interleukin 17A goes to the target cells. This is the osteoblast, osteoblast, fibroblast or synovial cells and the macrophages. These cells are affected now and these release in TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. These uh, TNF alpha which causes all the other uh, tissue reaction like bone erosion and proliferation synovitis of the joints and colitis. And the other theory is infectious uh, trigger by dysbiosis. Professor uh, Ravi Gupta also explained this. There is some dysbiosis, the gut in, uh, uh, intestinal system, the immune system is sensitized and this causes release of uh, interleukin 17A and interleukin 23. This again goes to the target uh, uh, cells and causes proliferation of the uh, bone formation and synovitis and colitis or enthesitis. These are the four major target areas and interleukin 17A and interleukin tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are the two prime mediators in this uh, cascade. The other triggers uh, which are very typical in spondyl arthritis and well proven is reactive arthritis where we have an infective agent in the gut or the urinary tract which causes bacterial persistence and cross reactivity and causing inflammatory arthritis. Secondly, in ankylosing spondylitis also, we, uh, there has been uh, fact uh, incidents of bacteroids triggering the fecal microflora to release inflammatory mediators. And more than 50% of the patients with ankylosing spondylitis and spondyl arthritis have microscopic ileal inflammation seen on ileos colonoscopy. So the prevalence of ankylosing spondylitis and HLA-B27, as we discussed in your uh, investigative armamentarium. Once you suspect uh, inflammatory uh, spondyl arthropathy, the next text we do is uh, HLA-B27. And this is one of the important genetic marker. If it is present, then there is high risk of getting uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, one in three, if you have a, a patient with a first degree relative with HLA-B27 positive state, there's a high chance that one in three risk you, you will get an ankylosing spondylitis. It is autosomal dominant inheritance. And but only 5 to 10% of the population with uh, HLA B27 positive status will develop ankylosing small lattice. It is also has cross reactivity with chlamydia or salmonella, which leads to reactive arthritis. And male preponderance has been seen over female females. And the age group is typically from 20 to 40. So, concluding the pathogenesis, the inflammatory back pain with enthesitis and uveitis. Strong genetic uh, predisposition, HLA mediated uh, uh, inflammatory response, and alteration of protein structure and release of interleukin 23 and interleukin 17 mediated uh, response leads to osteoproliferation and bone loss. We know this pathology, we know how to intervene early and prevent a disability for the patient. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja, for being very much in time. Well, now, we have been able to understand the basic pathology, how the APC cells in the presence of HLA-B27 keep on having the pathological changes leading to production of IL-23 and 17A production. And then we will be better able to understand what are the targets for which the treatment will have to be uh, directed. Now is the turn of Dr. 
अभय एलहन प्रोफेसर अभय एलहन सुइज प्रोफेसर एंड हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ऑर्थोपेडिक्स एम्स जोधपुर ही स्पीक्स ऑन स्पॉन्डिलो आर्थ्रोपैथी मैनेजमेंट इवोल्यूशन एंड रिलेटेड मैटर्स प्रोफेसर एलहेंस योर टर्न नाउ we can see your screen professor abhay yes your your sound is muted perhaps we are not able to hear yeah. you can you hear me now yeah, sir yes very clearly go ahead okay so my brief today thank you dr jha sir and all the luminaries for initiating this wonderful concept my brief today is uh, to talk of uh, the goal of treatment to talk on the current available options which include uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory dr drugs and biologics recommendations for uh, axial spondylo arthropathy current available treatment options like tn alpha inhibitors the interleukin 17 and 23 inhibitors and mechanism of action of uh, uh, and the doses of biologics and investigations and finally who becomes an ideal candidate for receiving biologics so the goals of treatment essentially address three issues one is to maintain quality of life secondly to control symptoms of inflammation and third is a long term goal to prevent structural damage as has been very clearly initiated by previous speakers that the ultimate goal is not just acute symptom control and improving quality of life but to prevent long term structural changes now goals of treatment we need to understand that anti uh, ag ag uh, the axial spondylo spondyloarthropathic treatment essentially is a target specific treatment but the controversy or the question that arises is what is the target and the next question is when should one intervene with treatment so individualized treatment though it is the future we need to understand that treatment has to be decided and tailored based on the biomarkers of response and the prognostic uh, factors that affect how a patient is going to degenerate or show long term changes or changes in the long term future and the most important pro, uh, uh, focus of treatment is to initiate fact initiate treatment modalities which will cause control of this aberrant immune inflammatory process as raja very clearly enunciated and and highlighted so the current treatment options predominantly are based on are the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and what they do is that they give symptomatic pain relief and if you study the exact uh, evidence which says which talks of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and biologics the nsaids essentially are very very good and have proven value for as agents which cause symptom control and they cause functional improvement in these symptoms but there is only some evidence to say whether nsaids cause stopping or slowing of, of uh, occurrence of structural changes or radiographic progression of disease which means that NSAIDs are great for acute control but may not be as good for a long term prevention of progression which is where these biologics come in so the treatment of ang spons and the peripheral spondyloarthropathies has gone a revolutionary change with biologic agents and the beauty of these agents is that they target very specific aspects of the immune system and as dr raja has very nicely uh, illustrated that it is these interleukins the interleukin 17 interleukin 23 and 12 the tumor necrosis factors and these are the points of where these agents are targeted in addition there are certain factors uh, certain enzymes phosphodiesterases which are called the jason kinases and we have jack inhibitors as well which focus on uh, uh, different aspects of the immune uh, system uh, on which these, these biologics act now again if you look at how biologics behave in terms and in comparison to non steroidal and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs biologics have been shown not only to give very good symptom control and functional improvement 
information that is acute control, but they have also a very growing body of evidence as to agents which will stop or slow the progression of disease, which is a major addition to what we could achieve with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And this is a beautiful uh, slide which essentially talks of uh, the, the focus points in the immune system where these biologics will seem to act. And these are the interleukin-12, the interleukin-23, the tumor necrosis factors, and the interleukin-17. So there are different components of this uh, inflammatory cascade, which uh, has to be targeted by these specific drugs called biologics. The mode of action of biologics, they will either be tumor necrosis factor, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha blockers, of which the common ones are etanercept, infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, and sertolizumab. Or they are IL-17 blockers with secukinumab being one of the very, very upcoming ones uh, uh, in this cascade, the other ones being brodalumab and ikexazumab. There are certain interleukin 12 and 23 blockers, which essentially are uh, the, the goselcomab and the rizenkizumab, and certain other blocking and stimulation agents which uh, prevent the interaction between the CD6 and the alcam, and that is the etolizumab. Now, the beauty of uh, the doses of uh, biologics and angspond is that most of them are, have a subcutaneous route of administration, which make them uh, very, very user-friendly, except for infliximab, which is an IV administration. But the basic difference is that etanercept, while, can, while etanercept can be given weekly as 50 milligrams per week, secukinumab and golim, uh, golimumab have the advantage that they can be given monthly. So the, after the initial weekly doses of secukinumab of 150 milligrams, per week at the, uh, on week zero, one, two, three, and four, they can subsequently be given uh, on a monthly dosing schedule thereafter. What is probably the uh, uh, rate limiting factor is the, the cost of this therapy. And that is where probably certain drugs which play uh, higher as compared to certain other uh, molecules. For example, etanercept probably would be a better and a much more used uh, uh, molecule if you have a financially a patient who is financially not very well off. Coming to the dose of biologics in, in uh, PSA, essentially the doses are the same, except that secokinumab has to be used in almost double doses, which is 300 milligram weekly at 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 weeks, and thereafter on a monthly dose therapy. So before we initiate any biologic, one has to be very clear what you are uh, that you could do no harm, and therefore it is there is a battery of investigations which need to be done, which include uh, the uh, CBC, ESR, CRP, the Mantus test, uh, which is the quantiferon gold test to rule out uh, any tubercular infection, X-ray chest, TCGs, the uh, liver function test, serum creatinines, and the ANA markers. The viral markers, which is the HIV and HPSAG, HCV, and the HPC uh, core antibodies. Blood sugars need to be done. Urine uh, uh, and stool examination need to be done. We have to make sure that uh, the female patients are not pregnant. And one needs to undergo an abdominal sonography to rule out any uh, outlying uh, factors that may be present. So coming finally to who should receive and who is a candidate for biologics. So these are agents where NS non-steroidal anti-inflammatory th drug therapy has essentially failed or where two non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not of much help or in situations where the NSIDs have caused gastritis and have caused other complications, but the patient persists and continues to have a high incidence of pain and stiffness. And essentially where the disease is affecting, uh, having a very major impact on a patient's life in terms of his absenteeism from work or presenteeism, which is essentially, uh, despite being present, the productive work uh, quantum of a patient is reduced. They are requiring to hire help for routine things, and it makes them lose the quality of life. So these are essentially indications where biologics have a very good and a very proven role. Thank you very much. For your time. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So you have been very much within the time and as a surgeon always tries to understand 
what are the various armamentarium available in his operation theater for any surgery so similarly you have displayed all the armamentariums available with an orthopedic rheumatologist for management thank you thank you very much now just sir just sir there is one question from dr ss mohanty from mumbai right he is asking that what percentage of uh, psa patients present without the skin lesion of psoriasis right uh, dr yugis you will like to say something uh, please repeat the question once again how no. many percentage no. dr mohanty has asked from the mumbai what yes. percentage of psa patients present without skin lesions of psoriasis without skin lesions you guys you will say something yes your 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 mic is off you guys yeah, your, yeah. yeah so without skin lesions we can have at least 20% even up to 25% who directly uh, present with arthritis isn't it it's a known fact You're right thank you okay yeah so now we proceed with uh, further uh, presentation that is dr a a rajamani he is a spinal surgeon from madurai he speaks on cytokine inhibitors and spinal surgical intervention so 5 minutes he speaks on cytokine inhibitors and for 5 minutes as dr manis has said that surgery is definitely a part of rheumatology did you say that manish yeah yeah definitely definitely right. so he will be speaking it is just time constant that he will he has been allowed only 5 minutes to speak on spinal surgical intervention dr rajamani please can you hear me yes very clearly yeah not an into all Excellent on the IOA and the endoscopy. And that's it. We can meet the other day. But anyhow, let us be going to the topic straight away. The, sir, be Close. near the mic. Be near the mic, or keep your mic near. Oh. Hello. Yes, better, better. Yeah, 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 yeah. my previous speaker has made my job so simple regarding the first half i'm not going to talk much about it but anyway as a surgeon i will tell you just what the principles i am see the role of cytokine inhibitors the primary drugs of nids and dmart are very good in controlling the symptoms that is the pain the problem is yet to be solved thus the pathology is inflammatory process enhances the disease activity and produces the structural changes starting from the inflammatory to the fusion so the treatment of cytokine inhibitors are to reduce the progress of the disease so that the long term functional improvement can be given to the patient and that role is done by the cytokine inhibitors what is cytokine it is a protein mainly of cell signaling and these are all the cytokine inhibitors which is very well told by two previous speakers and one next i would like to tell you that uh, it is all pleiotropic nature of cytokines which has got action on multiple cell types in different organs for example the action is different in macrophages and t cell action is different but the cytokine acts on all these cells and ultimately they expose the host t in So either the cytokine inhibition has to block or regulate the release of cytokines into the, all the cells in the body, and ultimately they have to stop the risk of infection. So no long-term therapy without the complication is possible with these drugs because they got action of cytokines on various cells. So the drug has to be salt restricted. We have side sorry side restricted. biologics which can be which can maintain the cytokines for example action of the macrophages has to be done there but the action of the t cell microbiome has to be stopped because once they act on the t cells the immunity will be low so still more the cytokine inhibitors has to be revolutionized so that the different actions of the different cells can be act together 
so that treatment can be more no 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 now the patient who already has been told clearly the patient's not responding to any or even in the earlier middle part of the disease the one thing the all the lab investigations even though it is elaborated i would like to come stress more on the mantor test and the quantifron especially for tuberculosis which there is a separate situation is going to be talked subsequently tuberculosis and cytokine storm you see now the current talk that is cytokine storms current with covid so this tuberculosis and this cytokines has got a very good role and it has to be ruled out whether the patient has got a tuberculosis so all other investigations are routine as already previously explained now coming to the treatment of the spine ankylosing spondylitis we have got three issues surgically treated it is very easy for us we don't need to spend much time to making and establishing a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis because the surgical role in the spine comes at the late stage of the disease either with the deformity or with the sagittal balance so of the spine is lost or there may be a fractures so the deformity is mainly the affected activities the vision when you the neck is bent down so far that they could not see properly and in the deep course of time they may get neurology and then the pain is aggravated so the deformity has to be corrected but it is not so easy a joke it is technically difficult and highly risky the deformity surgical correction there are so many types of surgery either pco or pso or bco as any spine surgeons most is very better and it has to be done the problem in these types of cases they do have a poor respiratory sort and the positioning problem on the table the patient is totally c shaped and it is very difficult for the anesthetist to intubate because if the neck is very stiff they cannot extend the neck for the intubation in spite of it that it is necessary to take adequate there are so many modifications have come with fiber optic endoscopic uh, intubation so with all these things we do correct the deformity and of course the fractures of course they occur with a trivial injury all three columns are disrupted it is highly an unstable situation what we call it as a toxic fracture the whole column of the spine proximal to the fracture or distal to the fracture moves in initial so initially patient may not have the neurological deficit patient can come with the severe minimal pain and one should not get away with that you must further probe further investigate to avoid a delayed onset neurology so all the columns are involved highly unstable so you need a long stabilization to be done at the longer segment than what we do in the regular fracture cases and sometimes can double lesion can occur like this for example upper cervical spine and lower cervical spine because the whole spine is a rigid spine and so a double lesion is very well common in ankylosing spondylitis now fracture sometimes associated with the epidural hematoma causing neurologic deficit the fracture alone need not produce a neurologic deficit but the epidural hematoma quite often occurs in ankylosing spondylitis because the vertebral bodies are all vascular the canals are relatively very much narrow and vulnerable to epidural bleeding it has to be recognized and it needs a decompression and it will give a good relief and the epidural hematoma the thing is there will not be any obvious finding in both the mri and ct but mri unless you specifically look for it you will miss it it needs a decompression and stabilization how to come down take home message reduce the disease progression by way of cytoinhibitors which is the best alternative to other drugs and targeting the therapy we have to be highly selective use of cytokine inhibitors because it has got a different action on different cells and the different organs and coming to the spine deformity correction to be done with the risk and caution to attain a sagittal balance and the fractures are highly unstable and then needs a long term stabilization and the recognize the epidural hematoma most of the times it is missed and then it has to be decompressed as early as possible thank you so much thank you professor raja mani for conveying the me- message and your last slide you have shown the anderson lesion it is very famous lesion seen in the spine which in fact is spondylodiscitis 
and you did talk about chance fracture or chalk fracture and that makes the spine very unstable thank you thank you very much now we go to the last but one professor santanu lahkar you stop sharing this slide please uh, professor santanu lahkar is from dibrugarh he holds a very important assignment as member rehabilitation council of india and is the vice president of indian orthopedic rheumatology association he has been professor and head of the department orthopedics at assam medical college earlier he is going to speak on biologics in special situations dr shantanu dr rajmani yeah. you stop stop sharing this slide Uh, Dr. Rajmani, can you see that? You have to stop sharing this slide. There is a red button on the top. Stop sharing. Yes. So, Santanu. Yes, sir. You, I'm coming. You, yes, please. So, friends, there are very many situations. Especially, we are talking of opportunistic infections. when we are treating our patients even with dmard but definitely when it is <clears throat> treatment with biologics so dr santanu is going to speak regarding same similar special situations dr santanu please yes. so good evening to all sir so i am speaking on biologics in special situation it is just like talking where not to do operation to learn it members so my slide is so instruction for use of biologics before treatment can you hear me sir yes very clearly go ahead so objective assessment quality of life clinical examination and then recommended measures of various type of investigation which i already discussed so patient education is important assessment of patient comfort then weight measurement and non responder we must recheck dose regime so patient fails to uh, indication for stopping therapy where patient fails to receive adequate response and various adverse reactions like uh, severe infection pregnancy we can stop temporarily and elective surgical procedure can stop it temporarily the recommendation for use of biologics therapy in preoperative period for elective surgery so one can see all this uh, period defined period for defined molecules one can avoid uh, uh, these molecules before surgery and in case of uh, post operative period again they can restart it if it is adequately wound is healed tuberculosis in india is very common and we must be very careful using biologics and all patient must be evaluated for risk of tuberculosis both active latin and reactivation and we must go through all this personal history appropriate screening investigation and when biologics are given there may be reactivation of the latent infection we must be very careful for this one in case of active infection we must treat tuberculosis first and treatment must be continued and in latent tuberculosis we must be very careful for reactivation of the disease and patient must be monitored closely for infection including miliary tuberculosis so all this um, uh, in hiv patient we can use all these um, new molecules in uh, which are available now but no data on il17 and il23 inhibitors used in patient with hiv but they are less commonly complicated by opportunistic infections methotrexate and cyclosporine should be avoided 
because of risk of opportunity infections. So thank you very much for your patience sharing at the end. I am thankful to Dr. Chow so who guided me in all this respect. Thank, thank you. you very much, Dr. Shantanu, for being in time and being very clear on what you wanted to say. Friends, I will now request Dr. Manis to, to chair the session along with Professor Dilip Mazumdar because the next presenter is myself and my presentation is proposed IOA guidelines for management of spondyloarthropathy. Well, yes, sir. Please, sir. Yes. Thank you, well, Dr. Can, Manish. Can we, can we ask one or two questions? Because there is a question from the audience. Uh, we, we can do it in the end. Is there okay, any problem? Okay, 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 fine, sir. Okay, right. So can you share your slides, Professor Jha? Oh, I, I think I have shared it. Didn't I share it? Okay, something went wrong. Oh, God. Something went wrong. What is the issue, sir? Yeah, sir, no, no. sir uh, share the screen and uh, yes, see yes, the screen yes. where we all yes. are seen. Yes, yes. Now I understand the mistake uh, you I share did. Share the whole screen and not uh, the particular PowerPoint. All right. Green, the green button. Green, green button. button share and then see where we all are seen. Select that screen, sir. Okay. Unfortunately, my presentation is not there now. It is deleted. So, okay, let me see if I can do it. Uh, can you I have to minimize that? Meanwhile, uh, no, 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 something went wrong. You will have somewhere, even the last year presentation will have somewhere, sir, the IWEB guidelines. You can select that from your computer. Uh, so, did, so, did you email to anybody? Oh, uh, no. No, okay. It is there in a minimized form, in a minimized form. No, no. Okay, anyway, in, uh, in the in the meantime, go ahead with the discussion. Discussion, yeah, that's what yeah, Dr. Uh, Naveen, we can take few few of the questions if it is there with the yes. audience. Yeah, yes. there, there, are, yeah, there, yeah. Are, there are two questions I, I can see on the screen. One is from Dr. Sibanda Rai. Uh, what about the DMA, DMARD drugs? His question is use of. So they want to ask the conventional DMRD uses yeah, and right. enclosing spondylosis before the use of biologics. Please. Yeah, yes. Who is who is answering that question? So Anish. So, so finally, it. yeah. So yeah. finally, the best DMRD to be used in. Uh, spondyloarthropathy if it can be diagnosed early as i have already mentioning at that time also that in early condition we should diagnose and if you are not able to diagnose then the undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy can be very well worked up and in those condition if the severity is not much enough then the salzopyrene is also a very good drug of choice which can be started accordingly if it is a little aggressive type then one can go for a salzopyrene along with a methotrexate before giving a fair chance and we all know that it takes three to four months to act it very well and before it we should not decide whether it is um, acting or not and uh, trying for the biologics and biologics should be the last priority it should not be the first priority uh, because we are surgeons we are from a poor country biologics are costly even after taking the biologics, the patient becomes so much resistant that they are not able to come back to the normal DMRDs. So please go for a conventional DMRDs first before going for the biological therapies. Okay. 
So the second question is also in the line of that biologics. Uh, Dr. Subran Sumonti is asking, there are a lot of side effects of the biologics as it causes the immunomodulation. Would you recommend every patient to undergo biologics treatment early in no. the course of disease? So no. I think I have already answered this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not. Clearly not. It is just like a thing. A uh, patient of a fracture neck femur is coming and we are planning for a THR. Right. Please don't right. go for it. I think okay. uh, uh, Dr. Now, Zai is ready. Yes. Uh, now my slides are there. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we start, Professor Jha. Yes. So friends, now we have discussed everything and we have formed guideline and we have to look into that history as Dr. Manish has been re-emphasizing is very important. So we have to suspect spondyloarthropathy and who are the subjects? Age of the patient less than 45 years and the symptoms have been persistent for three or more months of chronic back pain. Friends, I will again like to say that these are two routine investigations which must be prescribed but there is a but. We have, uh, we have been discussing it that if there is only one symptom, backache and nothing is seen. So one symptom, one MRI is good enough. If there are two symptoms and HLA B27 is the preferable thing that you ask for. There are 10 symptoms and if all the 10 symptoms are there or maybe even four symptoms are there, there was a slide in earlier presentation, it, the diagnosis becomes very much evident. So not that you are sitting with a promise that whatever might come, I will prescribe MRI. Okay, so now guideline number one says these two investigation if there is only backache. Guideline two says you have to classify it is axial spondyloarthropathy or peripheral spondyloarthropathy. Guideline number three says that you have to determine whether this is an active disease or a stable. Active is which one? Symptoms at an acceptably bothersome level. It will have to be judged by the clinician that this is an inflammatory pain. Is stable? You say it is stable only when minimum six months have passed and the patient should be asymptomatic or causing symptoms at an acceptable level. Then guideline number four, friends, here starts how you are serving the armamentarium. First line therapy, NSAID could be given continuously to NSAID. There is no preference over an NSAID, but not too, simul not too combined. Give one for one week, the other for three weeks. Or give one for two weeks, another also for two weeks. So, vice versa, these four weeks of trial could be given. Do not use systemic glucocorticoid. Mind you, for rheumatoid arthritis, glucocorticoid is a good drug, but not here. But if the patient belongs to peripheral arthritis, sulfasalazine is to be preferred over methotrexate. This must be remembered that there is some role of sulfasalazine over the spine. I will come to that later also. If the peripheral joints are two or less than two, then local glucocorticoid infiltration has to be, can be done. And even in cases of isolated cases of sacroilitis, you can do it under image, imaging like ultrasound. Avoid enthesitis areas. All orthopedic surgeons are very careful when it comes to Achilles, patellar, and cordyceps. Physiotherapy must be inducted. That is very important. Now, active ankylosing spondylitis, despite non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, comes second line of therapy. Now, here is the second line of therapy for which so many drugs are available. So first choice, TNF alpha, no preference, any TNF alpha. Second choice, 
Sekukinumab, which is anti uh, uh, IL-17, uh, uh, anti-IL-17. Ixezumab, but unfortunately, Ixezumab is not available in India. And third choice, friends, cheaper tofacitinib is available in India now. So this could be a drug of choice, but mind you, still it is not the first choice. It is the third choice. For patients with ankylosing spondylitis, inflammatory bowel disease, or uveitis, always prefer monoclonal antibodies like infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, golimumab over other biologics. Friends, guideline number six, stop, look, and go is the rule when you are crossing the railway line. So friends, if there is no relief by this time, when your patient has been on biologic, stop further investigate and may require spinal or pelvis MRI. Friends, guideline number seven, third line of therapy. Here you still have an active ankylosing spondylitis, but the patient is not responding from day one. So they are known as first degree non-responder despite giving TNF alpha inhibitors. So first is strong choice definitely becomes Seku Kinu Map. Second choice here is Tofacitinib. Second degree non-responders means initially they responded, but now after certain lapse of time, they are not responding despite the TNF alpha. So an alternative TNF alpha can be used. Guideline number eight, now your disease has become stable. What you do, physical therapy, Un, under unsupervised back exercises, not that every day a physiotherapist is coming. So let there be, there be a group of patients or maybe the individual himself can go for self-management physical education. A stable ankylosing spondylitis patient who has been on biologic, do not discontinue. Do not taper also the biologic. Let it continue till remission takes place. NSAID, if it has been there, you can give only SOS now on demand. It's stable on TNF alpha inhibitors and NSAID, stop the NSAID. It's stable ankylosing spondylitis on TNF alpha inhibitor and targeted synthetic DMARD, that means small molecules, continue TNF alpha inhibitor alone and stop the. Uh, targeted synthetic DMARD. Number nine, general management that you will perform at all stages. Monitor your patient. Use validated ankylosing spondylitis disease activity uh, measures. DAS, DAS CRP score or DAS ESR regularly will have to be uh, will have to be looked for maybe at interval of two to three months. Avoid using treat to target strategy with target of AS DAS score less than 1.3 or more than 2.1. This, this strategy has to be avoided. Avoid repeated spine radiograph. There is a habit, patient will also ask you, can you repeat the uh, radiograph so that the, you can see if the disease has diminished. Friends, structural changes cannot be prevented, though there are claims that some of the biologics do, do provide it, but on a long-term basis, maybe on four years use. Avoid obtaining spinal or pelvis MRI to confirm inactivity very frequently. Now, as Dr. Rajamani has said, if there is stable disease, there is deformity, there is osteoporosis, there is arthritis, so advanced hip arthritis, total hip arthroplasty, severe kyphosis, avoid spinal osteotomy unless you have a surgeon of the caliber of Dr. Rajamani or a well-equipped spinal center. Osteoporosis, chance fracture, or something like that, spinal fusion or advanced uh, osteoporosis, avoid spinal manipulation, rather fix them. Now, friends, we are in India and Dr. Manish has always said, 
look into the pocket of the patient. Are they able to spend on biologics? Perhaps no. So there are recommendations that traditional DMIRDs can still be prescribed in a patient who have been on biologics or cannot afford biologics. Friends, I have traveled all over India with this topic, with a rheumatologist present in the meeting, and I have come to know that almost 99% of rheumatologists with all due respect, they will start with biologics, but in the end, they will treat with conventional DMARD. So uh, whenever cost is a constraint, sulfa salazine is one which you must give because even otherwise it has potent anti-inflammatory effect similar to an NSAID. It is also antibacterial and immunomodulator. In psoriatic arthritis, higher doses of methotrexate are more effective. Results are comparable to rheumatoid arthritis and remission achievable in psoriatic arthritis is almost 20%, which is comparable. Now, friends, once again, I would like to say, are there evidences or you just want to start them? No, friends, there are level of evidences regarding these traditional DMARDs. Sulfasalagin and lefnonomide, they have a level of uh, evidence. Methotrexate and cyclosporine, they have B level. So these four things could be uh, uh, could be used in poor patients. Effectiveness in controlling enthesitis and dactylitis still remains controversial. So friends, the guidelines proceed step by step as per IOA guidelines that I have enumerated from one to 11. Achieve target for therapeutic strategy, achieve target for therapeutic strategy and what you want to achieve is remission or remission will include either an inactive disease or low disease activity. When we say it is inactive, when the uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis disease activity score is less than 1.3. If it is less than 2.1, we say it is low disease activity. And the target, if at all we can keep, is reduction of ankylosing spondylitis disease activity score by at least, suppose we started with four, and if it has diminished at the end of treatment by even 1.1, the treatment has been successful. Thank you. Thank you very much for silent listening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir, for a wonderful presentation and of the summary. Yeah, Professor Dilip. Yeah. Professor Jha. Yeah. So uh, these, these guidelines are very much useful. One should hang in the rheumatology clinic. Uh, right. Uh, the, <laughs> Isn't it? Yes. Uh, in fact, I must congratulate the president for persisting with getting these guidelines. And I trust and hope that this is the roadmap by which you can limit the disease. But only last night I was writing an editorial for a rheumatology journal that num two ends of the disease spectrum is very important. The very early stage, which we can say pre-rheumatic stage and very late stage when you can say almost non-treatable stage. So these two extremes you have to identify. Even presence of biologics and small molecules, there will be almost 20% or maybe even more when the disease becomes resistant to these biologics. And maybe then we have to backtrack and find out an answer maybe in our regional Ayurvedic, maybe other parallel branches of medicine might or, be of help. Or stem cell. 
well well yes definitely yes very rightly said yes dr manish i think now you could open this whole session all the 10 papers open for discussion just for 10 minutes we have we are so, beyond time yeah. right manish i have a yeah. question yeah uh, is there any role of nsaids uh, especially like uh, funeral butazone sir they all are same actually and uh, since it we require a disease modifying drug always in these type of present uh, these type of cases as we have worked up with the cytokine storm and everything like that so disease modifying activity is best been minimally and best noted with the sulfur salicylic actually okay. so ultimately even if you want to give an asad you need to have a disease modifying drug because the aim is the remission as soon as the remission has been gained the problem mm -hmm. is gone uh, well, Mr. Okay. President, Dr. Siv Shankar, you have very rightly said phenylbutazone used to be the drug of choice, and it is still advocated in some of the literatures that continue treating the, your patients. But there will have to be a stop. Will our patients tolerate phenylbutazone? There are a lot of side effects. Yes. So any NSAID, you have to say stop before the complications have taken place. Otherwise, it could be fatal as well i would like to uh, add on this thing these uh, early cases pondlo arthropathy i'll again repeat they do wonderful with the sulfur salicine they do wonderful so as uh, professor has already mentioned so many rheumatologists respected rheumatologists in our country and so many biologicals coming with the pharma, pharma uh, companies but still the gold standard would be the same methotrexin sulfur salicine if you are lucky and your patient is lucky they respond very well, actually. Right. Dr. Lahkar was telling something regarding those this his weight of the patient. I wish to make one point clear that the Asian population does not have weight similar to our European or American counterparts. So where the weight is not emphasized, the dose is not emphasized as per weight, and there is a fixed dose schedule, you can start the dose only at half the dose level. And I will like to add that I have almost uh, 1,100 patients in whom I have used etanercept. This is a published article. And I have said 50% of the dose only were eff effective in majority of the cases. So friends, even for IL-17 inhibitor sekukinumab, in market there is 150 milligram dose. But I say, if you look into their trial, they have made a trial with even 75 milligram. But when you ask them, why don't you market it? They will not market it for economical reasons. So even half the dose of the biological will make it cheaper for our patients. I still continue to prescribe etanercept, my favorite biological, and that also the biosimilar etanercept because they are yeah. cheaper than the biological. So those, I wanted to make this. Any other question from the audience? Uh, sir, I yeah. would like to uh, uh, make a point as uh, especially because we are all surgeons, uh, we could perhaps include uh, timing of surgery when biologics and other DMARDs are started. Yeah, right, so right. there are recommendations out there in the especially American Rheumatology Association, but whether it is different in our uh, uh, situation. Now, generally they say you don't want to operate when the effect of biologics is going on. And we know that with methotrexate and sulfasalazine, as long as the disease is controlled, you can continue these perioperatively as well. Uh, 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 what would uh, you know, the eminent uh, IORA faculty uh, have to say about this? As far as the biologicals are concerned, I think Dr. Lakar made a, a presentation in one of these slides that four times the half-life. Mm. Earlier, you should stop those drugs, operate. If the wounds have healed and there are no infection, again, restart. In the same vein, I would like to 
say that in pregnancy, what will be the our attitude when either a DMRD or a biologic has been given? Pregnancy. Uh, well, I would like to say that if one is planning a pregnancy, leflunomide and methotrexate are two drugs which should not be given leflunomide especially two years earlier. When you plan your pregnancy, it should be two years earlier. But if at all you have planned it late, it must be minimum six months. And cholesteramine wash must be performed. Otherwise, uh, neural defects, anencephaly like things happen. Selidomide, selidomide. Right. But if the patient has become pregnant, there is an advantage that the disease becomes under control for quite some time. It is only immediately after the birth of the child that the disease again starts progressing. But it is not a thumb rule that all the pre during all the pregnancies, the symptoms will abort. So there are almost 30 to 40% of pregnancies in which the disease continues to progress. And again, the safe drugs are sulfasalazine, as Dr. Manis has said, that this is a very good drug, and azathioprine. And also, if you continue with biologics, it is the TNF-alpha inhibitors, which are safe during pregnancy. Any other comment? So, so the take-home message would be like for any surgical intervention the surgeons are doing, one can continue the DMRDs, but for the biological, one has to take a rest, number one. Number two, please don't try to operate in an active disease because active disease may be presenting in a raised CRP or whatever it may be, which will again uh, have a complication. So maybe it is psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis or anything. In active disease, it should not be done. And the third thing which has been missed today is since all these conditions are associated with other comorbidities and as a surgeon we are always afraid with a diabetic patient with a fracture with a hip arthroplasty or water it may be like similarly as the autoimmune disease with the diabetes one has to be very much careful about about the prognosis of the case it's very important the uncontrolled diabetes with a very good control of the Ankylosing spondylosis may become a nightmare, not because of your therapy, but because of the diabetes. Only. All these so perhaps we should yes. include that in the guidelines that uh, Sir has just enumerated about timing of surgery. Very yes, true. yes, yes, very true. Uh, I, I uh, will include that. I yeah, didn't yeah. include because it was there in uh, Lahkar's. Uh, um, Nisa, you should include it because it is I, very important. I, 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 it will be released by IOA. So, I, as an orthopedic association, I, we should have I it. I was looking for something which I can make it 12 because 12 is a good number. Yeah, so, 12, I, yeah. I, now this will be a 12th one. Dr. No, Dr. 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 Jan, Dr. There, Dr. Amarna, there is a, there is a uh, question. There is a one please. question from again from Dr. Sobran Sumohanti. Right. Do the sulfasalazine alter the course of the disease? Yes, of it all, always course. alters. Of course. I Especially can. the peripheral uh, spondyloarthropathy. This, this is spondy, uh, This is the immunomodulatory drug. This is also works like an antibiotic and definitely has NSAID like effect. So even if suppose it is not a patient of uh, spondyloarthropathy, simple backache, maybe first stage is spondyloarthropathy, mechanical pain. I am in the habit of prescribing this sulfasalazine because that helps in chronic cases. Mm. Does uh, it sir, have uh, Amarnath? Amarnath has raised his hand for quite long time. Yes. Amarnath, yeah. Yes. Thank, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Uh, basically, yeah, I was uh, trying to uh, uh, talk. I mean, I, I don't know that I missed any because sometimes the audio was very low. If anybody has mentioned about correcting the osteomalacia first, because that is the biggest thing, which is a very very simple thing, and uh, as you all of us know rightly, the 
immunomodulation with vitamin D happens not at 30 nanogram or 40 nanogram, even though it's normal, but we need to have it at 80 to 100 because the immune modulation happens in that way. So just because somebody is a vitamin D, if you happen to test and it's going to be 40 nanograms or 35, or you're normally you're okay, forget it. No, I think I would recommend because vitamin D has made an immense, immense, uh, you know, difference uh, in correcting and treating. Uh, I mean, Shiva and Dr. Ja, with your permission, I can I can just uh, say the sentence. I mean, yes, you're talking sure. to your your thank thank you. You are listening to, seeing, and uh, talking. I mean, I'm expressing as a patient. I've been on the other side of the wall. I've been diagnosed to have spondyloarthropathy, spondylitis. I had peripheral spondylitis with so many parameters. All my, almost all my joints were swollen. I was on a wheelchair for five months. DMRD didn't help me a single, single time. I literally lost hope in my life. This was 10 years ago, mind you. DMRD did not help me much, but definitely it has a place. And at the five months, I was given then the etanacept. It was a magic wand within 72 hours, I started walking. My inflammation came down, my tablets came down. And you know, it is very, very uh, surprising. Uh, I know with AC, uh, ACR guidelines, we all follow. And then we also have ULAR and APLAR guidelines. They're all a part of it. Most of us are part of it. And we go through this. But in Indian population, definitely, I think, as Dr. Ja and Mani said, DMARD, salazoparin uh, has a major, major issue. And it will definitely make a big difference. Now, coming to the point, thank you for uh, clearing the air on biologics and biosimilars, because a lot of us are using biologics and biosimilars. And as you said, biosimilars are extremely, extremely, uh, what shall I say, economical compared to the you know um, originator molecules. So these are just a few points I wanted to highlight, because that's one thing which is very important today. As an orthopedic surgeon, like what Yoga said and Rajmani said on the spinal and uh, joint replacements, we are literally reversing the condition, if not at least maintaining them, not getting it worse. And by and large, we are uh, not getting them to the THR level because that's the biggest challenge. I think Yoga, we spoke about that and you had a couple of patients in Mangalore as well and the kind of challenges you went through. So, yeah. so this is one thing I would definitely say. So the biologicals are there as a, as a, I mean, I agree with Manish what he said is because we don't want to use the Brahmastra or the atom bomb in the first place. Let us give the smaller weapons first treatment and then we can go to the Ramban or Brahmastra. No? Right. Dr. Amarnath Abhay wants to say something. I have a question for Dr. Jha sir and Dr. Manish. And maybe yes. Dr. Amarnath can also take that call. Yes, yes. Uh, for what indication, other than the cost, would you be willing to substitute a biosimilar like a, maybe a sulfacelazine for an intercept or a biologic? The best would indication be is... Indication in your book. So the best indication has already been an example here, as Dr. Amanath has himself tell, told, not responding to the conventional best DMRTs. That is the right indication. Anna. No, no, my question, I think you missed my question. What would be your indication to substitute a biologic for, okay. uh, for a biosimilar? When, when you are nearing Other than the cost. Your, your target, when you are nearing your target, you have almost achieved low disease activity or maybe the patient has uh, reached uh, stable, stable disease. So that is one when you want to continue with something, you can switch over, number one. Number two, even before achieving low disease activity or remission, there may be a time when money is not a problem, but now you feel that the parameters are not favorable for using the particular biology. You can switch over to the lower side. Because then it will be active. It will be if it is in remission stage. It is a less active stage than these 
uh, 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 conventional DMRD, which were not active at that time, would be active and maintaining it for the maintenance so, point. Talking about biosimilar, I would like to say, once you have started using one company's biosimilar, do not change it to other companies biosimilar because the formula may not be same. So there is a warning, same companies biosimilar. Once we have started, same will continue. Yes, please. Just, Jogi, Jogi. just to drive home that point, would you allow me to share just one or two pictures, if you don't mind? Uh, quickly, why not? Yes, yes. Just because uh, this we is... We have a... now only five minutes. Yes, yes, sure. For okay. example, this is a chap who I had seen who was already on biologics. He was a 26-year-old when I saw him. And uh, the point I want to highlight for this case is uh, he has, you can see, a flexion deformity of 90 degrees plus in the hip and an entirely fixed spine with only movement present at the cervicodorsal junction. The point I want to highlight here is he was already on uh, a, a combination of methotrexate and sulfasalazine. And this fellow was stuck. He was not able to look forward when he was walking. So luckily, I had a rheumatologist who detected and he thought he was being treated. He was being seen by another rheumatologist in another city and he thought he wasn't treated, but we realized that he was actually only partially treated and the disease activity was not fully controlled. So despite the sulfasalazine, we then convinced him to stop because what I was worried about is, as it is that hip is very difficult to do, and when I do the hip, if the disease activates and causes fusion in the cervical spine, we are done for. Because in a 26-year-old, what have we got left? So we convinced him to go on a biologic for three months, got the disease activity down, stopped it, and then operated on that hip. That hip itself was one of the very difficult hips. But, you know, it's what I just basically wanted to drive home was that uh, this uh, partial treatment can also be a factor. So... True, very no, true. Wonderful, no, wonderful. As, as I have said, there are instances where yeah. whatever biologic or combination of biologic you do, yes. there are patients who are not easy to respond to those biologics. Yeah. So this can happen. So giving any medicine to this particular patient is almost like cooking something without burning the stove. Mm. So that is almost like it. Now, one last question, very common question for our postgraduates. Dr. Amarnath, if you can help me. Uh, there is a transverse osteophytes. Uh, will we say that this is uh, an osteophyte of degenerative disease or something else? Spondylophytes. Okay, no, he has problem with. Uh, no, no, I, no, I, 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 I see the main challenge. I couldn't hear your voice. Yes, fine. Uh, I think you should be able to hear. It. Just very briefly, what I wanted to emphasize: ascending osteophytes are the osteophytes which are representing ankylosing spondylitis. Any osteophyte which goes horizontally is a degenerative osteophyte. And the case that Jogi showed was almost a bamboo spine, though nowadays bamboo spine is a misnomer. And friends, I would like to conclude in the, in the end that we have said zero negative. This again is a very controversial thing. Zero negative or no zero negative because especially when it comes to zero positive rheumatoid arthritis, there are many patients who are negative, almost 20%. And only I was looking into the literature that a zero negative patient can get converted into zero positive subsequently. So the answer to a question that on day one, the rheumatoid factor, and please do not say RA factor, rheumatoid factor will be negative you should subsequently every three to six months, minimum three times, you should look for it. There are reports that even after four years or maybe 10 years, the zero negative has changed into zero positive. But many of these cases, cancer, other associated uh, connective tissue diseases, they have been responsible for this change from zero negative 
to zero positive. Friends, we yes. have no, one minute, sir. sir, sir, yes. sir. Yes. Professor Ra sir, Ravi Sauta has been uh, raising the hand for yes, quite long. There, oh, there, there, there are three or four. There are three or four questions are also there from the audience. We, we will yeah, like to Ravi, 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 Ravi Sauta first. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. Sir, I have seen few of these patients of osteoarthritis with the wet synovitis. Means the joint is shows lot of effusion, reactive effusion into the standard OA presentations. And if you start sulfur cellulosin in these patients, they respond very quickly. Even the Baker cyst can respond very quickly in these patients. What is others on the panel have to say about this? Sir, Dr. Ravi, these uh, it is very easy. <laughs> Actually, these cases are not OA cases. They are uh, seronegative right, cases. Right. And uh, we have got a criteria actually to diagnose the seronegative cases. And I, as an orthopedic surgeon, I am not ashamed feel to say like that. But we orthopedic surgeon are very easily able to diagnose a case of a joint pain as a OA. So please, it is not OA, it is a seronegative arthritis, it may be a CPPD arthritis, there are so many conditions, erosive arthritis. So it was responded very well, but it was not a OA, it was a seronegative case, sir. Right. There is I a have question. a question. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, uh, please. How you said that the disease has to be remission or it has to be low disease activity. Clinically, how do you evaluate, apart from clinical finding, do you have any laboratory test like yes, yes or yes, something? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I said ankylosing spondylitis disease activity score. This is a computerized evaluation. Even if you look into your Google, the whole thing will come. And there are certain questions asked from the patient and they are given some numericals. And it is out of those numericals that you, uh, you calculate 2.1 or 1.1 or, or maybe to start with it was 4 or 5. It is just like a VAS score. It's yes. just like a VAS score. Okay, sir. Or, right. and, suppose, and suppose, sir, if you are not able to go for it, definitely uh, uh, declining ESR, declining constantly CR, uh, steady, yeah. stable CRP without any anti-inflammatory with a proper history, with a proper clinical finding of any episodes of attack of pain. Of course, with a youth thyroid, with a, uh, a normal diabetic patient, normal diabetic score of the patient and osteoporosis. If all these things are normal, then definitely that is the patient is going to be in remission. Okay. The disease activity scores are correlated in one setup with ESR, in another setup with uh, CD active protein. Sir, how far the role of the arthroscopy in uh, your rheumatoid diseases? Oh, so, yes. This is one of the ARMA materials available to you. So when Yeah, we have not, like, not, no. not yet pronounced the name no. of arthroscopy. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. I don't agree to this. No pathologist is going to give a diagnosis of a rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis in their biopsy diagnosis, whatever the tissue material we are going to have it. So please don't go for a diagnostic arthroscopy in no, any of the rheumatoid condition or any of the spondylitis. It is of no use. I was talking about therapeutic. Yeah. If you want to perform a sinovectomy. Role of arthroscopy. If at all. Though with Only agents, a, a, agents available, you can go for chemical sinovectomy. And chemical not sinovectomy. Yeah. And not arthroscopic sinovectomy. Well, if there are no questions, sir, sir, questions are there. Questions are there. Yes, Audience please. questions are there. There are many please, questions there. Please. Time is off. Dr. No, no. Dr. Pardeep Bhagacha has asked, uh, he has asked which uh, uh, HLA B27 qualitative or quantitative is advised? Yes. Def definitely, it is a quantitative, but again, uh, I think as the professor has already mentioned, HLA-B27 in a course of a disease of ankylosing spondylosis with the disease settling down may become negative, may become positive. So it has not got much significance as far as uh, uh, the diagnosis and the prognostic part has been concerned. Okay. And what is the protocol of injection therapy after the making a diagnosis? Injection therapy means, sir? Injectable therapy, uh, some treatment protocol after diagnosis. Maybe biological therapy. So, so they have wanted to ask for the biologicals, yeah, which we have yeah. already been discussed. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, somebody uh, has I, asked the uh, role of phenylbutazone uh, 
in ankylosing spondylitis it was so we, we have already been discussed yeah president yeah. yes we have already discussed it yeah i think we can end it yes we uh, are already uh, over short by 45 be, minutes before ending i would like to highlight one more disease i have highlighted other spinal ankylosing symptoms diseases but one is elderly onset rheumatoid arthritis so e o r a is it identified clinical entity always keep it as differential diagnosis in late ages friends thank you very much it has been a very fruitful discussion and over and above this was a teaching module planned two years earlier we have been physically to different centers and talked about it there were only three lectures in one place but those three lectures have been divided into nine lectures i think things have been better clarified thank you pre president thank you secretary for you. having you, continued interest thank, thank you so much great thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much thank, thank you, you i'll thank stop you. the live streaming